What about opposite sex friends? Why is it that women would want non kin, non partner male compatriots? The data that I've seen suggests that what we might be doing when we form opposite sex friends is basically recruiting kind of like backup mates. And so um, that basically the preferences that we espouse for our opposite sex friends look pretty similar to our preferences for mates. And so it suggests we might be cultivating, you know, backup mates. And there are some data that people do this explicitly and, you know, they'll report being distressed if their backup mate forms a relationship. And so some people do this consciously. My guess is a lot of people might be doing it non-consciously, but still espousing similar preferences. Um, it's possible also that maybe same or excuse me, opposite sex friends might have served as protection, perhaps if your mate were really aggressive. So we might also be looking for those attributes. Especially if you're patrilocal, right? Because one of the ways that a cost inflicting mate who is doing more mate guarding would typically behave is that they would isolate their partner, their female partner from uh, brothers, fathers, grandfathers, etc. And if you've already been displaced geographically from wherever it is, you're pretty much on your own. And especially when it comes to physical vulnerability, I suppose that having a male friend around to do that. But it also explains, given the fact that you have had to really scrape the bottom of the barrel to find a reason that isn't to do with mating for women to have male friends, I think that explains one of the reasons why men get so uncomfortable when their partner, their female partner talks about that f male friend that they've got at work. And this is what I learned from David Buss's Men Behaving Badly, the failure of cross-sex mind reading, the male over-perception and the female under-perception bias of attraction, that you have this situation where women and men basically exist in different worlds when it comes to perceiving what's going on and this failure of ability to work out, to, to model the other person's world very much can cause two people both acting in a true way, acting in a fair and loyal way to see completely different situations and to actually have an awful lot of friction in their relationship. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I mean, even just the integration of male and female spheres is probably pretty recent, you know? So probably throughout much of human history, women were spending a lot of time with other women and men were spending a lot of time with other men. You see this in children, you know, we segregate really early. And so the concept of working with all these opposite sex peers is probably pretty a pretty novel challenge. And so it would make sense that it would cause a lot of friction if we haven't, you know, encountered it much through human history that now it's like, we just need to adjust to these new conditions. Do you remember when Peterson said on an interview, we don't know if this experiment of men and women working together in the workplace has worked out or not? Do you remember when he said this? It was about three or four years ago. He got slammed. He got absolutely destroyed for it. And maybe it needed more context or caveats, or maybe it's just the fact that he's a lightning rod for the culture war and anything that he says kind of gets taken as like, this is the new headline and we can go after him about like enforced monogamy or whatever. But mm -hmm. um, that's a, a genuinely interesting question. And it also, I, I've been on this thing for a little while that the current framing around uh, men and women and their relationships is very adversarial, right? It's super adversarial that men and women are competing with each other for something i don't know what it is resources or, or or positions within companies or status or victimhood uh position or whatever it is right men and women for almost all of history kind of really didn't give a shit about each other men were off with their men doing their men thing and women were off with their women doing the woman thing and they would come together they would have sex the man would contribute a bit here and there but for the most part we're in different worlds and this is one of the reasons that i've been really trying to drive home this intrasexual competition point because i think it is a really lovely antidote to this adversarial world where men and women don't have the language or the mental models to be able to understand how to compete with each other or why they should compete with each other and they feel like they're on different teams but they kind of really don't have any ground to be able to do it and it causes people to concept creep and just randomly create problems out of nowhere in an attempt to justify post hoc rationalize this reason for some sort of discontent but when you realize that almost all competition between women is with other women and almost all competition for men is with other men i know it, it gives me a little bit more breathing room and it also means that i know right okay this is 
The rules of the game are better defined. I understand how to compete with men. I don't understand how to compete with women. And I don't feel like I do. And yet I'm being told that I am. And yeah, I think the intrasexual competition thing, in my opinion, is going to be a very important area of research um, to publicize, to like really, really get out there because it's this beautiful, um, calming, balm antidote to kind of the cultural milieu that we've seen at the moment. I, I totally agree. And I, the argument that now we're portrayed as, you know, men and women are portrayed as antagonistic, I think is true. And I, I have some data with some, some colleagues, um, my colleague, Carl Aquino, um, and Simon. Uh, and he, so what we find is this, when you, when people encounter, um, sexual harassment policies that are really strict. And so basically these narratives that sexual harassment is widespread and the consequences are really steep. So the the risks of an accusation are very high. What we find is that corrodes opposite sex benevolence. So people are less willing to work with opposite sex peers. They feel less um, benevolence towards opposite sex peers. They have less um, motivation to engage in romantic and sexual relationships with them. And we even did the study where we asked them, how much do you want to donate to prevent the suicides of opposite sex individuals and they donated less. And so what I think is going on is that we keep talking about all the ways by which men and women could have antagonistic relationships by focusing so much on sexual sexual harassment. And sexual harassment is a problem, but when we emphasize it, we are creating this stereotype of men as sexual perpetrators and women as ready to levy an allegation at any behavior perceived as sexual. And so it's creating this, you know, the antagonism it's describing. Who's Marina Gertzberg? Do you know her? Oh, I, I think I might have found one of her papers. So this is from my newsletter a little while ago. Uh, hashtag Me Too has hurt women's careers. Women's productivity fell post Me Too largely due to fewer collaborations with men. A study of research collaborations involving junior female academic economists showed that they started fewer new research projects after Me Too. The decline is driven largely by fewer collaborations with new male co-authors at the same institution. The drop in collaborations is concentrated in universities where the perceived risk of sexual harassment ac accusations for men is high. That is, when both sexual harassment policies are more ambiguous, exposing men to a larger variety of claims, and the number of public sexual harassment incidents is high. The results suggest that Me Too is associated with an increased cost of collaboration that disadvantaged the career opportunities of women. Me Too was important to raise awareness, but the intent was not to impose costs on women's careers. Totally. Yeah. I, I think I, I found her paper and I was like, oh my God, this is the same exact pattern. There are other data yet showing that people um, are less like, so women don't want to be mentored by a senior male and that senior males don't want to, they're less willing to mentor junior women. They're less willing to hire attractive women. They don't want to hold one-on-one -on -one meetings with women. And so it, it's well, a that's, similar. That's, isn't that strange? That, that's, that's men, right? That's male mentors that you meant there. Yeah. but So it was both ways. Both um, the female. Yeah. yeah. But the point being that we're about to get onto it women also don't like attractive women. Yes. If men are fearful now in a post Me Too world of collaborating with women, especially attractive women, and women had a genetic biological predisposition going back tens of thousands of years of not liking attractive women, it's a pretty bad situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not great. It's So it's creating the very thing we'd like to prevent, you know, that this hyper focus on everything that could go wrong is creating less mentorship for women. If we want to enhance women's, you know, career advancement, then I think we just, we need to have a more nuanced approach of kind of what are the negative externalities of focusing so heavily on these problems, which do, it, it's tough because they do warrant attention, but it's worth considering how our attention has also created problems. The problem that you have is there is a current trend, I think reinforced by the reward of inflammatory language online, that overcooking or over-egging 
overemphasizing any issue that as yet hasn't been fixed is uh, allowed because we will get there quicker, right? If there is one sexual harassment that is one too many, that means that we need to continue to hammer the sexual harassment thing. And if we overblow some of the claims or if we make it more aggressive than it needs to be, that doesn't matter because when you compare using words that are slightly more inflammatory to somebody being sexually harassed, they do indeed pale in insignificance. The problem is that you don't get to see these much more below the surface, longer term externalities that come about by doing this, by overblowing these sorts of topics. What's happening, people? If you enjoyed that, then press here for the full unedited episode. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.